Hello, everybody. Hello, hello, and welcome. We are so excited. You are tuning in for today's Flipgrid live event with Ontario Parks. My name is Ann Cosma, and I work on Team Flipgrid, and I am so excited to welcome Catherine from Ontario Parks. But before we get started, let me just tell you a little bit about Flipgrid. We are a free video communication platform from Microsoft, and we are on a mission to empower every person on the planet to share their voice and respect the diverse voices of others. And that's why we are so excited about today's live event. Ontario Parks is located in Canada, and they are working to protect over 330 parks. And they are attracting over 10 million visitors each year. And in just a moment, we'll be joined by Catherine. She is a park interpreter at Pinery Provincial Park. And today she's taken us to the Great Lakes. So without further ado, here's Catherine. Hi, Anne. Thanks for that wonderful introduction. It's a beautiful day here, and I'm so excited to be here joining everyone. And let's see where everyone's joining us. Wow, we've got folks from Alberta, Washington, Delhi, uh, California, Russia too, Greece, Poland, Toronto, and Malaysia. Oh my gosh, that's fantastic. All right, so for today's program, I'm going to talk to you about how forces of wind and water shape the lands here into the sand dunes, which are one of the marvels of the Great Lakes. And that's an important habitat for a lot of wildlife species that live here today. Then we're going to take a fun selfie. And after that, Anne's going to come back and we're going to have some questions. So without any further ado, let's get to the lake. Here we are standing on the shores. Now, if you look out, you can't see land in any direction far out. And if you go out on a boat, you won't be able to see land in any direction quite soon. But all you have to do to tell that this isn't the ocean is to take a deep breath in and out. If I were standing at the ocean right now, then I would taste the salt on my breath. But this here is fresh water. And so it's nothing but fresh air. The Great Lakes, this one being Lake Huron, one of the five Great Lakes, are the largest freshwater system in the whole, whole entire world. Now this represents actually 20% of the world's fresh water, which is just an amazing fact. And the story of how the Great Lakes came to be starts 11,000 years ago. Back then, where I'm standing would actually be located under two kilometers of ice. That ice sheet, the Laurentide ice sheet, stretched across all of Canada and down as far as Ohio and Minnesota. It was massive. As it receded, it scoured through glacial scour, it created the Great Lakes system that we have here today. It, as the glacier melted, it formed pools of meltwater and that lake was actually not the Great Lake here today, it was one of the first lakes to form. Now, as you come into the pinery, you roll in and up and down and up and down over the dune system. The furthest dune system, dune out, is actually a 6,000 year old dune. And that marks the historic Lake Algonquin, which would have been one of a series of landscape into what it is today. There are six in total, we're standing here right now, it's a dune that's currently being built by the shores of Lake Huron. Now, how did the wind and water shape these sand dunes into existence? Well, it begins with what's called a littoral cell. A littoral cell has a source area where we have sand and sediment coming from. It has a transport path that carries the materials down following the current, and then it has a deposition or a sink area. Now here, if you were to go north, you would get to the, the source population, the source area, and the shorelines there look quite a bit different. They're like cliff faces eroding away. That's where the material comes from. 
there's a process called longshore drift that then carries them with the current. And if you were out in the water swimming on a regular day, there's a southward current that would actually carry you so that when you went in at one location, you'd end up further south down the way where you came out. Then through longshore drift, it gets pushed up onto the shore at an angle and the grains of sand flow down and deposit. And then the water washes back into the lake. From there, the wind starts to take over in a process called saltation. As the sand grains dry out, the winds coming off the lake, we have cooler temperatures over the lake and warmer temperatures over the land. And so the cooler temperatures over the lake push to the warmer temperatures, carrying the sand grains up onto the dunes. So this begins the pro process of so sand dune formation. If you look out onto our beach, you'll notice that we actually like to keep our debris on our beach. And that's be because it's important to the next phase of sand dune building. Come on, take a look. Here you can see a piece of debris up on the beach. You'll see on the one side of the debris, the sand level is much lower. And then on the back side, so the water facing side is lower and the back side is higher. What happens is we have saltation pulling the sand grains up and being pushed up over the debris. And then there's this dead airspace behind the debris where the sand grains are allowed to drop off into and build up the sand dune. This is what we call an embryo dune starting to form. As it builds up, we start to get progressively into this other system and another key player takes over. So, we began the process of succession. We started with bare elements of sand and water and wind. And now we're getting into the primary succession stage. And the key player in that is something called marum grass. I'll show you what it looks like. So this here is marum grass coming up green there. And what you'll notice about it is it has this extensive root system. All these fine rootlets are great at catching sand grains as they come up through that process of saltation and at holding the sand grains together into the dune shape. So this species is really important in stabilizing the dunes and allowing them to continue to form. Another great adaptation that marum grass has is that it can withstand up to a meter of sand growing on top of it. So it's really well adapted to its environment. It tends to be the first colonizer in these dune systems and stabilizes. From there, we start to progress through succession. And I'll take you down into the interdunal flat so that we can see what happens next. quieter, sheltered from the wind behind dune or the backside of the This means that it actually gets a lot warmer. And if you were here with me, you would have felt the temperature go up quite a bit. Well, while we're sheltered from the wind here in between the dunes in the interdunal flak, we're exposed to the sun, big open. And, blue. and what this creates is a really hot conditions. So the species that live here in this interdunal flak are actually adapted to desert-like conditions. One of them that I'd like to point out now is called a wormwood. So this wormwood, you'll notice it's very light in color. That's an adaptation to desert-like conditions. So when the heat comes down from the sun, if it were really dark, it would absorb all that heat. But as a lighter plant, it doesn't absorb as much heat. And that's one adaptation that you can have to hot. Let's see if we can find any other cool desert-adapted plants. Here's another plant called cherry, and it's got a great adaptation that helps protect it from these hot conditions. If you look really closely, I'm not sure you'll be able to see, 
but beliefs have sort of a waxing. This waxy coating protects it so that the water inside its leaves doesn't evaporate. It's another great way to adapt to these hot environments in the interdural slack. Here's another one, and I'm really excited to see. Cocoon is coming up. You can see there's some beautiful yellow flowers in there that are about to bloom. Cocoon doesn't look like a very big plant, half a foot maybe, but if you were to look underground, you would see its root system can grow actually almost as tall as size. So it's protected in that way. It's an adaptation to heat environments because the underground root system stays nice and cool and protected even when it's really really hot outside. It gets so hot in this interdunal slack that you could actually burn your feet like literally on the hottest days in the summer. So it's a pretty impressive thing. Now you'll notice that we're starting to see more and more species. Let's take a look at a few more and then I'll talk to you about succession. Here's some sand crests. Beautiful juniper, some cones and berries. See a nice wild strawberry. And here's a red cedar. Now, as you're starting to proceed, you're seeing more and more species. And that's what happens if you have your primary succession species that are able to survive in those exposed environments where it's just raw elements. And they pave the way for the other species to come in. The plant material starts decomposing and the rootlets are stabilizing the dunes. It adds nutrients to the soil and it makes it a more stable system. So we see more and more plant species arriving. Then, we start seeing the red cedars building into the canopy. So we're going from a completely open canopy into what's called a savanna system. The savanna system then eventually develops into an oak savanna. So the oaks start to take over. And on that 6,000 year old dune that I was talking about, we end up with oak woodlands and oak forests. So those are mature and that's this whole process. We go from these bare raw elements, our primary succession, our secondary succession, where we start getting into their savannas, and then we move on into mature climax communities. So I've talked to you today about the shore, uh, about the history of the Great Lakes and how they formed from 11,000 years ago, how the shores, the wind and the wave action formed the Great uh, the sand dunes that we're standing on. And then I also talked about succession and how we went from these bare exposed environments to these environments with multiple species. I would challenge you to think about the communities in your area, the ecosystems there, and how they are shaped by the elements like wind and water. That was great. Um, next, we're going to get ready for some questions. Take a minute have in the sidebar and we're also going to take a selfie all together so if you start getting your stuff together I'll go and get the selfie prop if you could uh, make sure to tag Ontario at, at Ontario and at Flipgrid our friends there too that would be great I can't wait to see all these photos how they come out all right is everybody ready Amazing, I can't wait to see them all. So remember, 
tag at Ontario Parks and at Flipgrid Live so that I can see all these fantastic photos and we can see how much fun you guys are having. Um, with that, I'll call Ann back if you're there. Catherine, I'm here. I'm here. I loved listening and learning from you. And we do have great questions that are coming in. So um, we've had some interesting ones about the sand dunes. One about curious about what predators might live in the sand dunes. Oh, that's a cool question. So yes, once upon a time, we actually would have had gray wolves here, which may have roamed the whole area. Um, but unfortunately, we no longer have gray wolves in this area because they've been hunted. Uh, so we don't have those large predators. We do have coyotes um, around here. And then we have sort of the lower level predators or the ones you won't think of as large predators. So we have like hognose snakes that are predators of toads. <laughs> And uh, yeah, those sorts of things. So we don't have a lot of large predators that occur here, uh, but we used to have wolves, which was fantastic. Um, unfortunately, we've lost them from the ecosystem. Wow, that's fascinating though. Interesting to know they, they've been lost and probably due to all kinds of elements. We have questions coming in about the way the dunes are made and with the wind and the elements, but the fresh water, is that needed to help make sand dunes? No, actually, there are dunes throughout the world. So you can see sand dunes all along ocean coastlines, but the freshwater sand dunes here are sort of actually a unique system. There's actually only a few of them that occur along the Great Lakes system. So we're really happy to have freshwater coastal dunes, but no, there's sand dunes that occur throughout the world and not even just on coastal areas. They can also form in deserts like you typically see, um, but they might have different types uh, of shapes. So this would be what's called a transverse sand dune, but there's a lot of different forms that are found throughout the world in dry, arid type situations. Oh, very cool. Well, Catherine, we're getting all these questions about the sand dunes, and that's great because today we actually have the Flipgrid topic of the day, which is called Freshwater Coastal Dunes Inhabitants. And friends, we're going to show you that in just a moment. But Catherine, I wanted to ask if you could let the educators and students who are tuning in, especially the teachers who are leading their students, let them know about the incredible Ontario Parks Discovery Library page and all of your content they can find there. Sure, I'm so happy to be able to talk about that. We have lots of resources for educators on the Ontario Parks Flipgrid website. Um, so we have our discovery booklets, which are a great resource to have or other things. And then we also have a section that's all at home stuff with the pandemic. We want to really support people in learning at home. So there's some activities for your backyard or around um, your neighborhoods that you can do. And then we have other things that are linked to curriculums. So the kinds of curriculums that we have, uh, the Ontario curriculum typically is the one we reference, but to education curriculums, um, they're organized like that. Uh, we also have French and English content and we are always adding new content. So we're, we're happy to have you come back week after week and come check what we're uh, putting up there. And then I also just wanted to mention that we at Pinery Park also through the Ontario Parks Discovery Program have virtual programs that we offer. So if anyone's interested to contact the Discovery School at Ontario Parks, and we'd be happy to provide virtual programming for your educational group. Oh, Catherine, that's fantastic. There are so many incredible topics in your Discovery Library content, but I want to let everybody know how easy it is to find this Flipgrid topic of the day so your learners can reflect immediately after the live event and share their learning. So my friend Chris is sharing his screen and it's simple in your browser. All you have to do, teachers, is type in aka.ms slash sand dunes. And this will take you directly to Ontario Parks Discovery Library page. You'll see we have it filtered to this awesome topic that is the freshwater coastal dunes inhabitant. And when you click on that, you'll see this incredible video you can use in your classroom learning community. 
questions to guide the students on their reflection and some information for how you can use it as an educator. But this topic is ready for you to use in your classroom right now. And so you'll notice the small blue button that says add topic. And when you click on that, you can determine if you want to use this as an individual topic or add it to your Flipgrid group. And remember, think of your Flipgrid group like your classroom. So once you do that, you will be able to edit the topic and customize it for your community and students if needed to make it meaningful and ready for you. And then the fun begins. You share the topic with your students and they're able to reflect on the questions and share their learning and submit their own response. And of course, they get to have fun using all of those creative elements inside the Flipgrid camera. So friends, definitely be sure to check that out after the event. We're going to post the link in the chat for you. And remember, it'll take you right to the topic of the day, freshwater coastal dunes inhabitants. And it's as simple as copying and pasting the link and getting that topic to use right away. So Catherine, we're gonna come back for some more of your questions. And we have a listener, Taryn, who is curious about how cold is it where you are? Looks like a gorgeous day today. Yes, it is warm and beautiful and sunny, especially here in the interdunal snap slack, but it's about 12 degrees Celsius. So it's maybe not as warm as you might think from looking. And I could understand the question because some of the other footage of me was in the snow, which was this really weird snow event that happened a few weeks ago. And we do get that in Ontario periodically where we'll have a late frost or a late snow. So, um, so it is still pretty chilly here, but we're really excited for spring to progress in the summer and get things warmed up. Oh my gosh. Well, it looks like a gorgeous day. Um, we have Thornton third graders who are tuning in and they're curious about the lake and if the water is hot or cold and some other students are wondering, is the lake deep enough for whales and sharks to live in? Okay, these are great questions. I love that. Um, yeah, it, it's pretty frigid in the lake right now. I would not recommend going swimming. Um, I usually won't even touch the lake for swimming until like late June or July, but then it does get nice and warm for swimming. Uh, we actually have these lovely sandbars, so it's not actually very deep right when you out from the shoreline. Um, and it's almost like the dune formation process is going on under the water if you think about it. So it'll get a little bit deep and then you'll have a sandbar, which is beautiful, excellent for playing on. And then another deep spot and another sandbar. It's a really cool thing to come swimming here. Um, no, we, we don't have any whales or sharks because both of those species would live in the salt water conditions, like in the ocean. They would not survive long at all in our Great Lakes system, um, but Lake Huron does get, it averages about 60 meters deep and at its deepest, it's about, um, I think it's over 200 meters deep at its deepest point. So it is fairly large. Um, it's the salt content that would make it so that sharks, sharks and I uh, wouldn't be able to live here. Thank you for clarifying that, Catherine. Mrs. Sanchez's class is tuning in. These are fifth graders who are curious about the other animals that live in the park. And I know you talked about some predators, but what other type of animal species might we see there? Oh, there's all kinds of fantastic animals that you can see at Pinery Park. Um, one of my favorites is the five-line skink, which is a lizard species. It's the only one we have in Ontario, so that's a pretty exciting one. Um, we also have some uh, turtle species, including Blanding's turtles, which are fairly rare. Uh, you don't see them a lot in these parts, and they're actually uh, quite endangered species, so um, we're pretty proud of them. Um, we see lots of bird wildlife. Um, we just had a lot of ducks migrating through, like fossil heads, uh, some pretty exciting wildlife there. Uh, yeah, so those are all exciting things. Oh, and the butterflies are all coming out. So one of the cool things that you might see in the sand dune area is uh, called an Olympia marble and they are actually, they live on the sand crest plants. So that's another form of wildlife that we've been excited to see lately. 
Oh, that's cool too to know. But that kind of leads into the this next question. Steve is curious about if he is walking across what appears to be open sand on the dunes, what damage might be happening underneath his feet? I am so glad he brought this. Up. This is actually something that the Pinery has had as a struggle. We really love having all our visitors here, but sometimes that means people walking all over the sand dunes. And unfortunately, that can spell death for the marum grass that is so important to stabilizing the sand dunes. So we actually have a lot of projects to try and help people encourage them to interact with the sand dunes in responsible ways. So we have what's called rolling boardwalks and there's information on our Ontario Parks blog about it. But basically we use recycled fire hose and wood to create boardwalks that move with the sand dunes and that people can use to access the shoreline without hurting the marum grass. So it's a really great project. Um, that we're using to sort of compensate for, yes, um, people, when you walk on the dunes and you go off trail, then you can kill the marum grass. And as a result, we end up with erosion of the sand dunes and actually will lose the sand dunes. So they, they will just fall apart, basically. Wow, what a great project to ensure the protection of, of what's going on and conserve the area too. Um, I think we have time for one more question. Miss Kim's class, some more fifth graders are curious about the plants that are in Ontario parks, if they're found in other ecosystems as well. Yes. Yes, so many of the plants that we find here in Ontario parks are found in other, or at Pinery Park, I should say, are found at other parks, but many of the plants are specialists to these dune ecosystems. And so while they might be found in other locations, they're actually quite rare in other locations. Um, so a lot of the communities, so for example, red cedars are very common here within the park, but as you move outside of the park in Ontario, you don't see red cedar habitats as often. Um, yeah, and the marum grass community is really along the shoreline. You don't see marum grass as you move away from the shoreline. Uh, so those are just a couple of examples of some of the plants that you'll find here. Um, and there are many rare plants that we have at Pinery. Um, we have things like uh, gentians and just many plant species that you wouldn't necessarily find anywhere else. Oh, cool. Hey, Catherine, we have a lot of questions coming in right now about snakes. And our viewers are curious, are there many snakes at Pinery Park? And are they venomous? We do have a few snakes at Pinery Park. Um, we have the hognose snake, as I mentioned, which is sort of one of our, um, it's not something you find in a lot of other locations in Ontario, so we're pretty proud of the hognose snake. Um, they're a very cool snake. They have this upturned snout and they pretend to be like a cobra, so you might think that they're venomous, but they're just trying to trick you. They're not actually venomous. And if you test them on it, then their next instinct is actually to flip over on their back and show their belly and pretend like they're dead. So uh, not a venomous snake. Uh, we do have in Ontario Massasauga rattlesnakes, but we don't have them at Pinery Park. So they don't occur here. And that would be the only venomous snake that might have occurred in this area. Yeah, we do have some other snake species like milk snakes and green snakes, ring neck snakes, garter snakes, water snakes. Um, but none of those are venomous snakes. We don't have any venomous snakes in the park. Oh my gosh. Okay, well, that's good to know. Catherine, I cannot thank you enough for sharing your expertise with us today. I want to ask if you have any final thoughts you'd like to share with our friends who are watching. Yes, so I just really wanted to highlight the importance of having protected areas like the one at Pinery Park. Because this whole whole 6,000 year old history of the Great Lakes and, and all of the habitat and communities and wildlife that survive within it. If we didn't have this protected area, none of that would, would exist. So 
it's really important to have protected areas so that we can allow these natural processes of wind and water to continue to happen. Oh my gosh, that is a great reminder. And thank you for sharing the importance of protecting these species and how we can protect the land and enjoy it at the same time. Catherine, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Today has been so special. I'm so glad that you got to spend the last half hour with us. And for everybody who's tuning in, we're so glad you got to spend the last half hour with us as well. We would love to see those selfies on social that you took with Catherine. Be sure to tag at Ontario Parks and tag Flipgrid too. We wanna celebrate all of this incredible learning with you. I've loved spending this time hanging out with you, hearing from Catherine, hearing from Catherine and visiting the Great Lakes today in Pinery Provincial Park. So remember, we will be back next Wednesday for another Flipgrid Live event. We're here every Wednesday at the same time. So teachers, lead learners, friends, be sure to visit aka.ms slash Flipgrid Live events to register and we'll see you next Wednesday, right? Don't forget to check out Ontario Parks Flipgrid Discovery Library content. It is live inside of Flipgrid on their Discovery Library page. And for all the educators listening in, if you're curious about how to dig deeper with Flipgrid and use it inside your classroom, I work with an awesome team of educators and we're here to help you. Jess, Renee, Feli, and I lead all kinds of Flipgrid professional development, and we'd love to have you join us if you're interested. You can visit aka.ms slash Flipgrid PD, that's P as in pineapple, D as in dog, and sign up for an event. So friends, thank you again for taking the time to learn with us today. We are so glad that you were able to tune in. Please take care, stay safe, and we'll see you at the next Flipgrid Live event. Bye!